everyone. Welcome to Association Rockstars, where we hear about the journeys and insights of amazing association executives and partners who are building the association industry of tomorrow. You get not just one today, you get us having a panel of brilliant minds, big hearts, and kind spirits that are joining us for this last episode of 2020. I am your host, Lowell Applebaum. I'm the CEO of Vistacova, where we partner with organizations on strategic facilitation. And let me introduce our host of rock stars that you see joining us today. Uh, in alphabetical order by first name, we got Adonia Calhoun Coates, CAE CMP, who is the CEO of the American Music Therapy Association. We have Chad Rummel, CAE, who's the executive director at the Council for Exceptional Children. We have Chris Romer, ACE, IOM, who's the president and CEO of the Vale Valley Partnership. We have Gayathri Kerr, the co-founder and president at FusionSpan. We have Ian Webb, who's the Director of Marketing and Engagement at the Printing and Imaging Association of Georgia. We have Janice Lachance, JD, FASAE, who's the Executive Vice President of Strategic Leadership and Global Outreach at the American Geophysical Union. We have Jeffers Makura, who is the Founder and President of the African Society of Association Executives. We have John Bacon, who's the Senior Group Club Publisher at Naylor Association Solutions. We have Juan Amador, CAE, who's the Director of Constituent Engagement at the Association of American Medical Colleges. We have Michelle Mills Clement, FASAE, CAE, RCE, who I think wins from the most letters after her name, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Association of Realtors. We have Nabil El Glory, who's the PhD CAE, the Executive Director at the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. We have Ray Arambula is the director of IT for the American Association for Respiratory Care. And last but certainly not least, we have Russ Webb, who's the executive director of the Bay Area Apartment Association. Amy has posted their bios. And so usually we would read them all. That would take half of the time that we have. And so please do check them out as well as connect with them on LinkedIn. They'd love to connect with you as would all of our rock stars from this year. So feel free to read more about each of them. If you have questions anytime, put them in the comments. Uh, but we have a lot to go through in a short time. Hi, everyone. All right. So I've teed up some questions uh, that we'll see how the conversation goes. Maybe we'll get some others along the way. But to start with, uh, I'm just curious. As we think back at 2020 and oh, the year has been, what are some leadership lessons that you think 2020 has taught us? Janice, I believe that you volunteer to kick us off. Okay, I'll start there. Uh, what, what I have seen in the last year and what I think is absolutely going to be needed going forward is more participatory leadership. Uh, the issues that we're facing are so complex, so interconnected, so challenging. Uh, the systemic racism that we've dealt with this year that's been uncovered this year and over so many years, the COVID-19 pandemic, the economic fallout of that, there is no one person sitting in a corner office who has all the answers. We have to expand the table. We have to grow the table. We need different perspectives. I've started to see that this year, and I think it becomes more and more important as we go forward. I love that. Thank you. Others, what uh, leadership lessons has 2020 taught us? I can add to that. I think Janice did it very well, but part of what I've been learning is that we've always talked about leadership skills, and this is the time when we're virtual, in the new virtual world, where we really need to rely on a couple of them, empathy being one. And so what I've learned is, should I send that email to a member who's on the front line? I know I want a deliverable. I know I want them to volunteer, but is it worth it? No, because... They need to save a life, you know. So communication, I'm, I'm finding that regardless of whether you are at the C-suite or any other level, we're over-communicating. And so um, part of that means, hey, choose the time wisely <laughs> in terms of communication. And I'll add it to the integrity piece. I think it's so important um, just because there's so many societal issues that we are facing right now. I love that. The uh... Empathy and communications. I typed out the email in, in haste and in response, and maybe I don't hit the send button just yet. There should be a delay timer. I like it. 
John, did I see that you, oh, go ahead, Chris. No, I, sorry, John. We'll apologize for stepping on your toes there. I, I think that one of the big lessons is the need to be nimble and flexible. Mm -hmm. Things have changed so fast and, and so often. Um, something you know in the morning has changed by the afternoon, and that's a, a, an ongoing regular occurrence over the course of the past year. So the need for leaders to be nimble and flexible in addition to some of the things that were already shared, I think is really important. Perfect, thank you. I feel like everybody took all my answers. I wrote, I actually wrote that be nimble and flexible. That's been the biggest thing that's been my hurdle this year um, that we kind of had to force ourselves to do. Um, and the other thing I think either Janice or Juan said is being a better resource. It has allowed me to really lead with empathy and really work on over communicating and how I'm and how I can be a resource, not only for my clients, but also my friends and my family. So personally and professionally, it's taught me so much. Um, but yeah, being nimble and flexible was that's that's my number one for sure. It taught me a lot. And I think that's gonna help me moving forward. I love that. John, idea. I'm really, I'm really sorry I stepped on your toes then. <laughs> all good. Uh, shared thoughts, it's all right. Right. Catherine? Um, it's I was going to say all of that, but I, I, I have one more, which is more, I have learned that the power of listening, um, especially in 2020, I feel like we miss that human connection. So we want to share more. So just being there and listening, you don't have to say a word, but it resolves itself in magical ways. So for me, that has been a very key lesson. I think there's a beautiful blend between that and what John said, that like one of the best resources that we've learned to be is to be better listeners. So many people just need to be able to have someone to talk to. I think that's great. Michelle? I really wanted to say I've learned about the concept of grace and I, I've had this concept with me for years, especially once I, I had my son, but this year it has been a concept that has really helped my leadership um, it has to be extended to everyone, to members, to staff, to board, to leadership, any capacity, but more importantly, it has to be extended to yourself. So I think all of us as association rock stars and whatever capacity we consider ourselves a rock star, we have to throw grace to ourselves. And I've had moments where I've said, when has someone given me grace on missing this deadline or not doing this? And, and the answer is, you know, I got to give it to myself sometimes. So I think taking that pause and letting everyone have that time and patience for this is not normal. This is not the new normal either, because it's not normal. Yeah. And I think we all just have to learn to, to give everyone and ourselves grace. I, uh, I've inserted a permanent slide at the end of all my presentations that says space and grace. I love it. In perfect world. That, that's that. how I end yeah. every presentation. I think you got Ian, Jeffers, and then Adonia. Um, mine is, I mean, as a, so as a young professional and someone who's relatively new to the, like, you know, full-time workforce, um, I have learned kind of in a different form factor, but like the importance of having leadership um, over you. Like, you know, I, I have not, you know, I've, been in this role for just that two years and before that I was in school for 22 years and so I you know I don't have the life experiences to look back on you know well, well what what did I do when this happened like you know my is my thing is such a small amount of you know library of knowledge that I can pull from so I've learned the importance of leadership from both like you know my supervisor and my mentor network that I can pull from, ask questions, you know, be able to talk to them about how would you handle this? And then I can take that and, you know, I get to move that into like my future career and then pass that along to people that, you know, I will end up supervising and I will end up mentoring. You know, that's the way I'm kind of viewing leadership from a different perspective. You know, there's a nice intersect there uh, between the leadership you've looked to, as well as Janice's first statement around participatory leadership and how there's a mutual beneficial relationship there between leaders and other leading. Jeffers. Thanks. I think for me, what I've learned this, this year is the power of uh, agile leadership. You know, we are in a situation like no other. And actually, sometimes you want to sit back and 
and try to see how you can navigate through these difficult times, how quick you make a decision that actually supports your mission and also your goals of your association. That matters a lot because none of us really came to 2020 thinking that it's going to be the way it has been. So that power of making quick change from what, what you've been comfortable doing to what actually everybody's trying to struggle and, and achieve. I like that. And we'll take one more on this question, Adanya. Sure, I was gonna say just being creative and learning that uh, information, ideas and opportunities can come from many places those that we expect and those that are unexpected. And I think most importantly, just ask for help because I think in this environment, no one has all the answers. So everyone at some point needs help. Excellent. Well, that's already a great list to start with. Uh, you know, those are lessons that perhaps you've learned from the space. I'd love to hear a little bit in the past year from a few of you about any growth that you've personally seen as a, as a rock star. How is this year in all of its hurdles, still been a place of growth for you. Uh, I'm not sure, Nabil, would you like to go first? I have to use the raise hand so I move my cursor. Well done, uh, it's well done. So uh, I think there are two lessons that I have from this year about my leadership style. Um, first is, I, you know, I've learned really to trust my instincts. I, um, I really, uh, benefited from, uh, you know, I, I didn't have that chance as, as a new ED to really do a lot of stuff, you know, as I was building trust with the board. But when COVID hit, actually before COVID hit, when I started prepping for COVID, um, I just, I did what I had to do. And th those, the, all those decisions paid off. So I was really glad with that. And then the second thing really is, you know, think about fo lead with foresight. Mm -hmm. um, think ahead. Um, one of the best th decisions I made for COVID this year was one I made last year when I switched our phone systems from a landline based system to a VOIP. And, um, and we take 400 calls a day, sometimes 600 calls a day um, for, you know, an office of 30 of 23 people. And uh, that that decision was a smart move back then, and I've continued to learn, you know, to think ahead, so that we that we've been able to be nimble and, and pivot as needed. Love that. I have Ray next, and then I have Chris, and then Russ. Thanks, Lori. Uh, I I've always kind of been one that um, adapts well to change, um, but like many others, this change was, was on a whole nother level. Um, you know, in addition to, to COVID, I personally just experienced um, lots of changes that I had never experienced before. And um, I'm typically someone who likes to keep my work and my personal life separated. Um, but I, this past year, I began to see, I began to see the negative impact of that. And I let my professional uh, get in the way of being relatable. And so I'm, I'm starting to open up more and just trying to find those relatable experiences and, and opportunities uh, within my network, within my coworkers, um, even in, in the vendors I work with. Um, I mean, they love to talk and, and tell you uh, and be real, real relatable with you, but I'm, I'm learning to do that myself um, just for the benefit of, of understanding that people are going through things outside of work and uh, we don't always have to keep those separate. Love that. Well, your answer was certainly very relatable, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Chris. Yeah, and I'll, I'll actually build on, on Ray's comment with a different take on it is that I think what, what 2020 has really helped teach me is the, the need to assume good intent. We've got members, we've got stakeholders, we've got so many people coming at us from so many different directions on so many different things. And so often their hair is on fire. Right, it's the, it's the biggest emergency and I need you to drop everything and do this for me right now. And um, you know, much like Ray's comments with a different twist on it, assume good intent, understand that they're under that level of stress and understand that, um, that they're looking to you to help address or solve their problems or sometimes just listen. But, but understand internally that 
um, what they're taking out on you probably has nothing to do with you. That they're, you know, they're, they're tr looking to you to solve their problem and you need to assume that good intent. Excellent, thank you. I got Russ, then John, then Chad. Thanks, Lowell. Yeah, this year has been um, an interesting one for all of us for a bunch of different reasons. You know, I think you know, what it's taught me is that um, in, in for my growth this year is that I left a very comfortable position that I had been in for 21 years and to take on a new challenge. Um, now, had I known there was going to be a pandemic, had I done it? I don't know. Uh, maybe the thought process would have been different, but um, I learned that everything that I thought I knew um, that would work doesn't necessarily work when the world flips upside down. Um, I learned that that sometimes the most amazing ideas come from the most unlikely places. Um, I've learned that. And I also learned that uh, you can accomplish a lot with a small team if everyone is on the same page. Um, and that has been for us the saving grace this year and reinventing an association from scratch during the middle of a pandemic. And, you know, we've, and because of that, because of our team working together, growth personal that we had is also then related back to our professional growth where we grew 30% as an association in size this year. That's great. That's been um, something that I've learned is that, you know, get everything you thought you knew. So. And I'll have to say in the midst of all of that growth, if you are, are colleagues with Russ, you'll see the beautiful pictures of the of the bay down there in Florida and see he's suffering greatly with all the sunshine and beach he has outside his door. It's tough, it's tough. Yeah. John? Uh, I, for me, uh, this year has been interesting because I find myself talking to my team and talking to friends in the association space. And I would always say, oh, you need to find ways to, to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And then, you know, this year I really had to practice what I preached. Um, and it put me really on the front lines of really being able to not only trust trust my team more, but also to be able to communicate with them more effectively. And I think those are those are really some of the things that I that I have been able to work on given the circumstances. But I think it's something that I'll be able to take with me, you know, from here on, you know, continuing in my career. So I do think, you know, as much as we know the negative aspects of, of everything going on around this pandemic, I think I will say, you know, the positives have been really being able to reevaluate where I am personally and professionally and being able to work on that as well. So um, I would say that would be my personal growth is just continuing to find ways to effectively communicate with, with internal and external stakeholders. Um, and it's actually, and it's funny, I read a book one time that said, uh, when you're at work and you squeeze an orange, um, orange juice comes out. You know, if you squeeze it at home, tomato juice isn't going to come out. So what you work on at work, you got to work on at home too. So I took that to heart this year. I definitely have been a part and party to seeing a number of people who are working at home with partners or spouses and are like, I don't know who this person is in my house, but like work spouse, I don't know, I don't like and send them back to work. Uh, and so coming to places of peace and harmony in, in our homes is probably something a lot of people have been working on this year. Uh, all right, I had Chad next in line, but I'm going to throw him for a loop and actually ask him a different question, uh, which is that, you know, there have been many discussions around next and new normals. And so I just want to, I'm curious, what are changes that you've seen that you think are here to stay? And which ones are a place do you think that's a change that's just starting and need to be enhanced? Which are the changes that are going to stick around? That's a, a great question. I want to start by saying that I hate the phrase new normal and we all need to stop saying the phrase new normal because there's nothing normal about us right now and it's not going to be normal post COVID. If we are trying to return to our old association after COVID, we're doing something wrong. So I'll start by saying that. Um, to say what's going to stick around, you know, my professional career has been 100% in the age of digital information. Um, I was the first person I knew that had an email address, which isn't cool because you have no one to email, but that's for another day. <laughs> um, and that whole age of digital information made it so easy for associations to share resources and to become knowledge leaders through that process. But as we've seen in the last year, this age of digital information has become really what I call the era of mistrust. What we, what we gained by just sharing information before is no longer happening at the same rate. 
We can't put a product out there and expect people to just trust us and trust our product. We have to really do a self check right now into our brand as knowledge leaders to make sure that our members are still seeing us in the same way they were and that everything we're rolling out has that, um, that peer review, that evidence-based data, all the pieces that are gonna continue to make us knowledge leaders. And I think if we truly capitalize on that, if we focus on doing a check on our knowledge leadership brand, we can really push ourselves forward at the same time. So I think the, the era of mistrust is not going to go away and it gives us a charge to really, um, to look inside that and see how we can build ourselves stronger through that. Perfect. Gather your hands up. I'm not sure if it's from the last question or this one. So I'll see if you have some thoughts on what changes you think are here to stay. Sure. Um, for me, like 2020 has been interesting. It's, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't want this to be the new normal, but I think it has disrupted the events industry tremendously. I don't think we're ever going to go back to having events fully the way we were. I don't know what it's going to be in the new phase. I think time will tell, um, but I, I, I don't, I mean, I think hybrid might be the new normal. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but the other piece of it is, I'm gonna uh, add on to what Chad said is, I think the digital experience really creating personalized impactful experiences for your constituents and members that's definitely going to be a focus moving forward. Uh, we've been able to connect with the constituents in 2020 that way, and I don't think that will ever roll back to, to what it was. I love that. I love the, the focus, not just on creating the event, but creating the experiences needed. Wonderful. Janice. Well, I want to build on, on what both um, my predecessors talked about. This this existence that we're living right in this minute, being online, being together, I think is a part of our lives going forward. And I'll give you a great example. AGU, today is actually the last day of AGU's annual meeting. It's fully virtual, had to be, right? It's the same thing we've all gone through. We had 25,500 people register and attend. And from 110 countries. It was staggering, it was exciting. We stretched it out to go over 14 days instead of concentrating it all. And what we heard from virtually everyone was that they missed the personal interaction, but they loved this idea of being able to participate in something that maybe was unaffordable or that they couldn't do otherwise. So. I agree, going forward, we're not going to go back to a fully in-person meeting. And I also think our world of work has changed. I mean, yes, it's challenging to have work spouses, children, pets at home getting involved in your day, in your, in your work life. But now we have people who save time commuting, who've helped with climate change because they're not moving around quite so much. Uh, people who are comfortable in this environment and it's helped them with balancing some work and family responsibilities. So how do you go back and should we go back? Shouldn't we think about a new model to getting our work done and achieving our missions? And that's what I think we can use this year to really build off of. Uh, we have a comment that uh, has been shared from Gail Simonofsky that she loves hearing that folks are trusting themselves, listening harder and finding grace from within. So what we're saying is certainly resonating. One thing I'll say Janice about going back is that I think a phrase I've had to use too many times is that unless you have a flux capacitor, you cannot go back. You can only go forward. That's and, right. so, and so what does that mean? I have Michelle and then I have Nabil. You know, I think people are going to rethink travel and I, I do think we'll get back to meetings. I do think we'll get back to going. I mean, I personally will be the first one at any convention I can go to because I'm over the online ones, but there's going to be a different mindset around how long you're there. Do you need to be there for the full time? If it's a hybrid, can you go in for a certain part and come back home? Uh, and I think that comes from the sense of family and being present. Uh, like I've mentioned, I have a toddler 
and being home these last nine, 10 months, um, being able to see him every night really set deep with me. And it's really going to make me rethink which meetings I need to go to or where can I split a meeting with another staff member, or another team member to go for a half of a conference and I go for the other half. And I think we might see shorter conferences as a result of that, or we might see less attendance, not necessarily because people are scared to go, but the community around family, I think, has been restored and a lot of people don't want to be away as long as they used to before. I think you're right. Nabil? Um, two comments. I think regarding events, I think the there the need for more uh, chapter local based events is going to grow so you can get that in person experience and not travel so far. So I see a lot more reliance on chapters. Um, and then with regard to remote work, I think we are embarking on a period of work from anywhere and not just work from home. So my company, my association is San Diego based and we have hired over the last two years, three remote employees for, um, for geographic purposes, like a lobbyist in the state capital in Sacramento. Um, but I just took tomorrow, my first employee moves to Kansas City. Mm. My, and and this one, employee was the person who objected to all the remote work before. <laughs> and so, and part of what I've been doing was really been laying the framework for that to potentially happen at some point. But then it also expands my workforce. Because yeah. in San Diego, there's not a lot of people who know associations or AMSs. And now I could potentially hire people from Chicago and DC uh, or Sacramento and not have to bring them here so they could stay where they are. There's some real exciting opportunities here. And I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm about to hire about four new staff. I'm expanding in this, in this yeah. economic crisis. And I'm looking forward to what can I do in, in this time period? You know, the, we're, we've been talking so much about uh, virtual events and virtual meetings and about and eventually this is gonna go to hybrid. I do wonder what hybrid staffing looks like in the future as well. What does it mean in terms of completely virtual or in-person? Jeffers and then Juan. I, I think Nabil basically is, uh, said what I wanted to say, the power of remote working. We, we've actually experienced exponential growth and it has come to actually our understanding that even working from home, you even work longer for long hours. And, and, and also you do much more than sometimes you do when you commute to your office every day. And also when you look at actually the advantages of working from home are much more even to big organizations because I've seen a couple of big multinational organizations which have cut down on the cost of rental. You know, they've actually trimmed or reduced the size of the office. So to an extent, they have even told them that their staff that if you want to work from home, we will, we will, we will buy you, we will say, help you to subscribe to your internet at home. We will get you maybe anything you want. But you know, the bigger picture is they're actually saving on their rental, which is normally one of the highest costs of any organization. And obviously I do agree with Chad when he said about technology, you know, technological transformation has actually taken us something maybe we could have taken 10 years to adopt. Now we've basically taken about 10 months. Yeah. That is really, really something which none of us thought it could happen, especially from where I come from. I've seen a technological adoption and I'm quite impressed that actually we're at par with most developed parts of this world. One. Yeah, no, it's a great conversation about the workforce. And so I'm going to put my parent hat on because long uh, are gone the days where there were snow days. You know, it's like there are no snow days for parents. And so in a virtual world, when you are uh, working and you have all your meetings from 9 to 10 and you have family commitments, that balance is it's become merged. There is no uh, separation. And so in my association, we've established parent groups um, to help this, uh, to get us through. 
Um, we've established uh, different virtual support groups um, to talk about, hey, when your IT doesn't work but you need to be on that call or your video goes out in between that meeting, um, or as Lowell, you just asked, how many staff members does it take to put on a virtual event? In an in-person meeting, I know in my association we had maybe 15 to 20 for a five-day meeting. On a virtual, we just had our annual meeting and we had over 150 staff members dedicated to a virtual event because we had so many concurrent sessions. And we want to provide that experience for our members of saying, hey, we want you to connect. We want you to... Uh, gain the content that you're asking for and so it's tough yeah well certainly one thing about as we look at the year past to the year ahead I'm not sure anyone would say it's been easy uh, but I think we're hearing a lot of good lessons learned and potential you know one place I'd like to ask of course you know I would love to be in the room doing this all together we're doing this over zoom in isolation you know how have you been connecting and developing relationships during this time uh, where have you been nurturing those relationships? Nabil? So um, I, I got to go back to one of the answers that we talked for the first question, which is listening. Communication is a two-way street, and so often associations push out information and don't listen. And I think that has been one of the biggest keys is listening. Um, uh, but then also quality communication. So um, in my team, what I used to do, so I have a small office. I have 23 staff when I, uh, 24 when the pandemic started. And so I would walk around the building every morning with my cup of coffee. And then sometime in the afternoon, I'd walk and just sort of say hi to everyone, pop in. You know, I couldn't do that anymore in remote world. So one of the strategies I developed was I would post a video on Slack every morning and say something, you know, and then those, those messages would start to take on what I was hearing from folks as I was talking to them privately. So I talk about self-care, I talk about schooling, I talk about, um, you know, the challenges of working at home and then race issues came up and we started talking about, you know, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and, Having those conversations, uh, my, my team really appreciated it and it allowed me to stay connected to them in a way that I didn't envision in a remote world. So I think listening and then really figuring out ways to communicate with, your, with, your, um, with the different constituent groups that we have. Yeah. We have a whole conversation on how Zoom helps or hinders listening. Uh, I love how you've actualized it into actually forming relationships. Michelle, then Chris, then Juan, then John. Yeah, I think Zoom actually has helped. I know everybody always says they're Zoomed out. Um, I, I don't think so. You know, I think there are so many times and it would be just a text or just a Facebook post. And now we're all jumping on Zoom because we all can be on there together. And it's allowed also for shorter meetings, which allows more time. And it's a little bit easier to say yes to some of those meetings um, because hey, can you do a 15 minute virtual coffee on Zoom? Yeah, I can handle that, you know what I mean? Versus going to lunch, you know, being there for two hours, getting back to the office. So it's allowed me really to foster relationships with people that are out of the city of Chicago, across the country. Um, it's a lot quicker, it's faster. And then personally, you know, my son's birthday party was for 20 minutes on Zoom and that's the best thing ever. You know, all the holidays we've been able to get all of our family on. My birthday was a couple of days ago and we were able to do like a trivia night. Um, even in the office, we try to do different innovative things. Like we built, I'm gonna say the word wrong, it makes fun of me, a terranium, terranium, the plant thing, the succulents. Terrarium. Thanks, that. We made that. We've done a wine and um, chocolate tasting. We've done, so, we did a magic show. I just really think Zoom has brought in the power of getting everyone together. And while you can be tired of being in front of a screen, it's allowed connections that I just know would not have happened if we couldn't just quickly click on a link and talk for 15 minutes. Excellent. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, I think the key with regards to this is just being intentional. And, and that can be Zoom, that can be phone, that can be text, that can be whatever it is, but you need to be intentional and you need to make it a priority to stay connected. I have a group of um, 
of chamber colleagues. And we, we are on the tech string that started in, in March. And I think every single day since then, there's been at least one message and sometimes as many as, as 90 or 100 between this group of six of us across the country. And, and some of it is silly and some of it is, is very timely business information and things we're working on, um, but it's intentional. And it's, uh, that's the key. If it's Zoom, whatever the, the, the channel of delivery might be, the core needs to be that the staying in touch and staying connected and staying um, in touch with people is, is an intentional effort. Yeah, I, I definitely resonate with that. You know, no ASE annual conference this year. All the people I would normally get to high, high five, hug, spend time with, be told what I did wrong in the year, all, the, all those things, right? I have to actually seek that out intentionally. I think you're absolutely right, Chris. Juan? I love that, I, um, that comment, Chris, about being intentional. So I'll build upon that because it's one thing to um, network and you outreach to someone or your network when you need something, but it's a whole different ball game when you are nurturing a relationship. Um, and so, you know, having that, um, going back to let's have a, con a call, you know, instead of having that virtual Zoom coffee, uh, asking about family versus, hey, you know, did you, what do you what's your association doing? Or asking about, um, your, your, um, your experience in terms of leading virtually, um, whether it's a, a meeting or another enterprise with the association. And so the other thing I'll add is in terms of being intentional, when you have a staff, not only do you have to um, prioritize your own health, your family's health, but then if you lead a staff, you have to motivate and you have to be there. And so being intentional about nurturing your staff relationship has become key right now. Um, I've implemented a, a couple of exercises at a staff meeting. We ha I had everyone do a color. Um, ju uh, just print out a thank you or make a thank you, and I asked them to take a photo and submit that to me, and we made a video, and then we repurposed that to send out a thank you to our members because I think that, again, building that relationship with your members is not just about here is, you know, renew. Here is it's about selling the value, and the best way to do that is to be there for our members. Love that. Okay, Athri? Um, I, I've always been, I've relied on body language and, and tones to kind of tell me how, how to, to build relationships in a way. Yeah. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing is we all feel like we're living at work right now. Um, and, and so when I reach out, that's the last thing I reach out and ask. It's more about how are you doing? How is, how is family? How is, you know, anything personal, but I, I try and stay away from, from keeping it about work, right? Making it about the person. So for me, that's been, I, I think that's something that's going to stick. It's not for now. It's, I really actually enjoy that. It's, it's helped me uh, learn more about the connections that I'm making today. I love that. John. Uh, I'm kind of piggybacking on a few, uh, what a few of you said, but just being intentional. Um, the Zoom has been uh, done a world of different, just from a standpoint of you may not think it or not, but I'm not as outgoing. So having a Zoom call and making sure I have my face on the camera when I'm talking to clients, making sure that they can see me, even if I can't see them, sometimes it, it actually encourages them to turn theirs on and to be able to talk to them about what's going on in their life with family, because we're all dealing with the same things just in a different way. And I think being able to, to relate to that and to be able to build and, and nurture a relationship based on that has been huge for me. Uh, Juan said it too, even with staff, I feel like I've had more one-on-one -on -one conversations with everything that's been going on this year uh, and being able to have and understanding how people think, I think it's made people more vulnerable, which helps build that, that relationship. And, uh, so I, I definitely agree, you know, even going back to Michelle's point, as far as any time I have an opportunity to get on camera with somebody, I'm, I am being intentional about seeing if I can get them on, even if it's 10 minutes. I've been able to meet with clients, you know, in person that I have never been able to meet with, just being able to utilize Zoom. 
And I think it's really helped strengthen those relationships. So, you know, that I'm glad I could take, you know, some good out of out of the bad going on. But that that has really helped me and that's gonna to continue to help me move forward. So you know, I've uh, I've taken to I try every day to three people that I haven't spoken to in a while, just sending them a text saying I'm thinking about you. Right? Easy, but just like to know that like even in isolation, like we're still present for you. Jeffers, and then we'll move to another question. I think for me, um, the best thing that uh, could have happened as a result of this is uh, basically creating deep relationship with my family, especially my wife and kids. You know, sometimes we spend a lot of time traveling, doing meetings out there, and it takes a toll on actually our family. You know, staying home, having my kids trouble me in the in my makeshift office at home, having knowing them, knowing that dad is around anytime they can walk in, even when I'm on a Zoom call, they just pump in and they start saying hi to everybody they see on the screen. You know, that for me has actually cemented my relationship much more with my kids because today when I actually leave home, even, even if I'm actually going to a very short distance, they'll ask, Daddy, where are you going? What time are you coming back? It never used to be like that. You know, I used to be always out there. You know, they say, bye, safe journey. See you when you come back. As in, I see the relationship has actually improved tremendously with my kids and my wife. So for me, really, that is the best thing. And probably it's like uh, uh, finding salvation in the devil, you know. Yeah. <laughs> COVID came, but actually it came with this advantage, yes. Well, I'll say I'm, I'm sad we haven't had a, a pass by yet of the kids to be able to have them wave hi to us yet. Too late. It's too late. <laughs> too late. Fair. Good. I'm glad they're sleeping. Uh, <laughs> all right. So let's let's shift questions and shift focus. Uh, Russ, am I calling you on first for this one? So we've been talking a lot sort of about how we've been individually building relationships and our benefit. Are there any places that you are focusing on for giving back? Places where you're dedicating your time or resources for here? Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, it's, um, I think I start thinking back to when I started in association management so long ago and the people that were my mentors and the people that helped me out. And I moved into the association world and had no association experience and came from, you know, hospitality and had to kind of find and feel my way. And knowing that those people were there for me, then I kind of made that a, um, uh, a project for me during this year as I realized that a lot of people were getting you know getting uh dejected from having to cancel events and were getting upset about not having the member experiences they were used to and so especially some of the younger um association execs so I've started to reach out to them and tried to help and so for going forward what I'm trying to do is you know I'm I'm lucky in that you know my my member base stayed really engaged and I was able also to partner with another association that, that's that's like a similar associate, uh, similar to what we do. That's only, you know, an, ge geographically an hour and a half away, and we do a lot of our education together. But because I'm a trainer and a speaker, and they have a trainer and speaker, I realize that not everybody has that ability. So one of the things that I'm doing to to give back is I'm trying to help out as many associations as I can, as with with training. Um, something that I can give and something that that's, you know, I, I think that the importance of sharing your gifts is so very important. And um, it never became more apparent than this year, for sure, for me, uh, when I think back to the people that were there for me when I began. And so that's what I want to do. I want to do that for, for you know, all of my colleagues and people that will become colleagues for you know, all over the place. Well, Mr. Santa hat, it sounds like you have lots of gifts to give out. Ho, ho, ho. I, they, I knew it was coming at some point. I'm surprised it took this long. Perhaps your son will have something to say about it. <laughs> yeah. um, mine is a, kind of interesting. So I, I went to the University of Georgia for two degrees. I spent a lot of time in Athens. Um, but UGA has a program called the UGA Mentor Program. It's been around for years. It's, I mean, like I've always kind of seen it. I wasn't involved with it when I was at school. Like I didn't request a mentor or anything. But after kind of, you know, the beginning of this year when I was like, oh, wow, this, the real world is weird um, in a COVID world. And, you know, if I was a young professional coming out of college right now, like what, I don't know what I would do. 
And so I signed up with UGA to become a UGA mentor. And um, I recently, I say recently, a couple months ago, I got paired with a mentee. Um, and so it's been very interesting because kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, like things that I was learning from my mentors, um, namely my own father, which is really helpful to have someone in close, such close proximity to me to ask and bounce questions off of just constantly. Um, you know, I can take a lot of my lessons and pass them along to her. And like by default, like, you know, I've gotten to know her roommates and her friends throughout this process as well that she lives with. And so like, I've kind of become you know, a professional mentor for them as someone who's not super far into the career, but far enough to, for them to look out and be like, okay, well, I want to be there in a few years. You know, they're still a couple of semesters out from graduating. Like they're still trying to figure out what they want to do. Um, you know, how does remote work work? Um, things that you don't learn in school, um, but like questions that they have. So that's uh, one of the things that I kind of learned that I needed to get back on. Mm -hmm. I love that idea of mentorship being not just those that are far in their career, but those that are also next step in their career too. I think there's really nice applications for that in terms of board mentoring and volunteer training too. I love that. Uh, Michelle, then Janice, on job. Michelle. Yeah, you know, for me, it's it's similar to I think what we just heard. I've been trying to give back in a way that is vulnerable. Um, we know about Black Lives Matter, the reckoning with race and everything that's happened this year. And um, I, I joke at times saying, yeah, part of my job is turned into explaining what it's like to be black um, for the last 40 years for me. And some people are just now getting it. And I decided to find a different way to do that. So it kind of started with just talking to small groups or speaking to different um, realtor organizations. And then it's led into um, the passion project that we have called Text to Table that is almost like our, our gift back to the industry where we're sharing our personal conversations and being vulnerable, quite frankly, um, with the association world and beyond and talking about what race and leadership really is like for us. And that's been an opportunity to, in my opinion, give back because those are personal things that you like to hold tight. And a lot of times you'll think you should already know, I shouldn't really have to tell you this, but you do. And I think I've taken the patience to understand that people need to have those conversations. I've offered myself as a safe space for those conversations. The realtors just issued a public apology. Um, the National Association did a few weeks ago. Um, our association had done so about three years ago. And I was involved in speaking uh, on a national meeting about this. And there were a lot of members in the comments, you know, saying racist things and hateful things and not agreeing with it, not understanding it. And I reached out to all of them and mailed them a book and invited them to talk to me. And that's my gift back to the industry to, to have a conversation with someone that you know, doesn't share the same views and doesn't value your life in the same way. But um, what's been impactful with that is there's been relationships that have grown. And there have been people that have read said books and there have been people that have been able to ask me the hard conversations and have me, asked me the hard questions rather. And we've had the hard conversations that have turned around and that makes it worth it. Even if it's just one person um, that has made it worth it for me and it makes it easier. Well, you, you gave me a good, a good prompt to plug it because Text the Table has definitely been a, a gift to our community. Uh, this is being recorded on Thursday, December 17th, and the next episode's coming out tonight at 8 o'clock. Uh, and so, uh, Amy or someone who's in our crowd, if you could put the, the link in our, uh, wherever this is streaming, Facebook, YouTube, uh, everyone should definitely attend and check it out. I get so much out of each one and grateful all four of you for giving that to us. Thank you. Janice. Yeah, uh, Michelle, thank you for that. And Ian and Russ, um, your, the impact that you're having on your communities and the way you're choosing to give back is, is very, all three of you are just so incredibly impressive. Um, I have the privilege of having an awesome network and I want to try to leverage that network for people in our community who may have lost their job may need, um, may be looking for something else because their association is struggling. Um, I 
I have, for good or bad, applied for a lot of jobs in my time. And so I think I can be helpful there and I want to be. And so I uh, really encourage anyone who's looking, who's concerned, who's worried about the economy, worried about their future, reach out to your colleagues. There are a lot of us who are really willing to help. And I'm hoping to spend a good amount of time over the next year doing that and getting people back on their feet. Excellent, thank you. Adanya. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think I've spent a lot of time uh, just being a resource for a number of people. Uh, as I think most people in this group at least know, I recently uh, moved up to the CEO uh, role and I had been in the meetings industry for a number of years prior to that. And so many of my colleagues in that space have reached out to me, people wanting to get to the next stage of their career or looking for a ways to pivot in their career. And I think that I, I've just offered myself in so many ways to so many people and trying to be a mentor and just trying to be a resource and a connector in a number of different ways to help people get to the next level. Because I think so many of us, uh, we get to these spaces and you don't always know. Some people have it all, they always know you were going to be right here. And then there are people like me and you get here and you're like, whoa, hey, how did I get here? But it's great. So I think, you know, really being authentic and talking to people and letting them know that the journey is whatever you want it to be. Yeah. I mean, I think that's been so critical for me uh, throughout my entire career, but especially now as I've moved into a new space and really trying to let people know that, you know, it's here for anybody who wants it. Well, uh, you know, we shared some questions we thought about discussing beforehand. And there was one question that only got one response and Ian's the one who responded, I, which was any new sources of information and perspective that have been added to your watch list or playlist or subscriptions during this time. And so since he's the only one that responded to this question, he's the only answer I'm taking. Ian. Um, so I got really into discussion groups and uh, like, I don't wanna say newsletters, but basically like independent journalism. Um, so obviously a lot of my world is marketing and design. So there are several um, newsletters and like community Facebook groups that I have joined since kind of March time, um, some are paid, so it's like, you know, supporting like small independent journalism and some are obviously just community groups so you just join and discuss. Um, I have found myself way more in touch with the current standings of the broader marketing and advertising industry in the past six, seven months than I have basically the entire time when I was getting an advertising degree. Um, so just basically like being able to talk to people who aren't necessarily just in association marketing, but in all marketing, I've been able to bring in things that I would not have necessarily thought of before. Um, ideas like mediums, um, just various things that I've brought in into my um, like actual association work um, from someone who might be working in healthcare or someone who's working in government, like yeah. just being able to kind of see other things, see a broader picture, and then kind of pull out those bits and pieces. Um, and I think, and at the same time, you know, supporting small, independent, local journalism is also very helpful. I love that. I was, uh, I was on with a, a group of Shrep uh, association leaders yesterday. We were talking about how to better increase perspectives of our leaders. And we said, what if organizations actually had a list of publications, right? Like everything from Harvard Business Review to The Economist to industry to, so, right? And every board member got to choose one publication that the organization would pay for their subscription, but the board member had to like send articles they found interesting back to the rest of the board. So you got like all this like different media come back to it. All right, we're getting near the end of our time. I wanna to try to get at least one more in. Uh, and the, the question I think that I wanna to try to bring here is what are the conversations that you think association leaders, current and future, need to have in 2021 to continue to evolve our industry? Uh, Chad, we'll start with you. Um, sure, great, great question. And I, I think that association management can be a field where we um, tend to eat our young, so to speak, which is really ironic given the purpose of associations. So I think first and foremost, if we're going to continue to evolve, we have to double down on our commitment to support our early career people. 
it's imperative that we continue to invest in them. You know, getting a CAE shouldn't be an option for a few. It should be an expectation that all can afford and all are encouraged to work toward. And I, I think that we also need to do a better job of marketing our profession as a profession and not a job. Most of us fell into associations, we know that, but could you imagine how different it would be if there were 19 year old college students who were training to come work for us, who wanted to come work for us? I mean, I think of all the association friends I have, I know of one who went to college knowing she wanted to work for an association. So I think we really have to position our profession differently if we're gonna continue to grow because we need that fresh blood coming out, those new ideas coming out. Those college students are being trained in the same programs that we were, but they're being trained in very different things. And we need them. We need them to not go work for Price Waterhouse Cooper for five years before they fall into an association. So we need to A, market our profession as a profession better. And when we get those early career folks in, we need to treat them like this is their career for life and really show them and support them how to make that career. Because you know, some of the best people in our field have really white and gray hair, or in my case, very little hair. And where are we going to be in a few years if we don't start to change that and turn that around? And I think we've all had this conversation about our association. Well, it's time to have it about our field as well. Love the passion that you bring to that subject. Thank you. Ray. Um, you know, I think I, I've heard the comment that uh, we should all just, uh, you know, put 2020 down the toilet and forget about it. But I think there's a lot to learn from it. Um, and I would just say that um, if, if we haven't done this already, um, you know, start having those conversations and it doesn't have to be all the time, but, you know, maybe every quarter, uh, what, just ask this question, what should we be anticipating? What is it that we haven't anticipated and what should we be anticipating? And I think this past year has taught us um, to do that, hopefully. Excellent. Thank you. Juan. Um, I think the conversations that I would like for the association community to focus on is the action behind the words. So a lot of associations put out press releases, news releases when it came to systemic racism and things that they were against and stood for. But now I'm really looking at our association industry to, to show and demonstrate the actions. Is it volunteering? Is it giving money? Is it edu uh, including um, educational opportunities, opportunities about racism in our content, uh, at our meetings, whatever, uh, leadership changes, the pipeline programs? I think that we have an opportunity to help increase the voice of a lot of communities and not pin communities against each other. Yeah. I think that um, I know we've been focusing a lot on, on um, Black Lives Matter and some of, the, um, some of my colleagues say, hey, where are the Latino voices? Where are the women voices? And it's all about intersectionality. And so uh, it, there's a lot of work to be had, um, to be done, I should say, um, by our associations. I love that, thank you. Nabil? The question I'd love CEOs and C-suite members to ask themselves is, how are you better supporting your staff? Um, so, I mean, we know women are dropping out of the workforce, and I'm sure that's occurring in the association industry um, due to the pandemic and homeschooling at the same time. And we should really be thinking, how can we do things better to keep our great staff. And so that's that's the thing I've been reflecting on this year. Also updating all our employee handbooks to reflect work from home because all of them were written based on coming into the office. So we all have to do some real boring policy work, but it's important because we never envisioned this. You know? I'm pretty sure Nabil just offered to rewrite everyone's oh. handbooks if you want to send it his way. Uh, Michelle? I'm similar to Juan. Um, let's let's see the action behind the race, equity, and inclusion, and and not get stuck behind the word diversity and paint diversity broadly and call it diversity in geography, diversity in the color of your hair and your eyes. Be intentional. Uh, we're talking about racial issues and how to right those wrongs, 
And we need to have these conversations as associations. A lot of people say, I live in the present, I don't live in the past. So why do we have to talk about that? Because it's present. It's present yeah. for many people that have been quiet for way too long. And there needs to be ways to increase that wealth gap. And I think associations, as strong as we are, we have the power to do that. So we can't get fatigued and have to keep those conversations going in 2021. Absolutely. I'm going to take two more and then we'll wrap up. Jeffers. I think for me, uh, the conversation I really want in 2021 is especially to do with the people or who we have in our boards. You know, how do we make sure that the new board members or the board members actually see the vision of the association like let's say the CEO sees it, all the staff sees it, because there's always a lot of uh, uh, push and pull when it comes to that. You get that board members don't see things the way you see them. And every moment you try to make them understand, it's like it's an unnecessary fight. All it's like, hey, we, we also know what we're supposed to do. So you realize you waste a lot of time trying to, to, to respond to things which they could easily learn. So. Yeah. and also make them committed to actually what you stand for. I like that. Russ. Yeah, thanks. I, I really like this question um, a lot because I think back when I first met Noel, I said, I said he, he said something along the lines of, you're not like a normal association executive. And I said, I'm not like a normal person. I, I think differently. My brain doesn't work like other people, but I, you know, one of the things that for me that I think as associations, especially after what we've been through this year that we really need to be doing in 21, you know, everyone touched on it a little bit, but one of the first things is, do the people in your boardroom look like the people in your membership? Um, is, is, that, is that what they look like? Because if they don't look like your membership, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. Um, that needs something we need to be working on. Um, and I see it in so many different groups and I've helped strategic planning for some groups that I have said to them, look around. I mean, not everyone in your membership looks like you, but you all look like each other. That's a problem. Yeah. Um, second thing is, you know, as, an, as associations, we have got to get rid of sacred cows. We have to. Uh, just because you've always done the bling bling awards does not mean you need to continuously doing the bling bling awards. If they don't work, get rid of it. If, if, you're, if your staff it, if your staff and volunteers are spending an inordinate amount of time working on a program that has little or no benefit to the industry or the organization, it has to go. It, that sacred cows should be gone. And the last thing is, you know, we are who our industries are. Um, that's who we are. Our associations are who our industries are. And why more of us don't understand that developing careers within the industries that our associations represent um, career development, recruiting people into not just the association world, but into our industries and having career, full blown career development programs where we are. I mean, for so long, you know, we've perpetrated the belief in society that people need to, and Ian and I talk about this all the time, that you come out of school and you go to college and you get your bachelor's and you get your master's and then the whole world works out for you. Well, not everybody works that way. Um, and there are whole industries that, do, that don't have workers right now. The industry that I represent has literally tens of thousands of open jobs that can't find people to fill those roles um, because they haven't been trained for that. Um, I have a friend who runs the welding association, the same way, they can't find welders. The welders make great money. So career development is something that I would say we need to be spending a lot of time on as associations. Um, and that's something that you know I'm kind of passionate about. So I think, I think that, but yeah, rethink the way that we've always done things. and. I like the fact that 2020 has forced us to speed up the evolution of associations. I, I do like that. I'm going to take facilitator privilege uh, and actually answer this question. And so my question in the conversation I think the association leaders need to have in 2021 to evolve our industry is how do we better focus on gratitude? I think that each of us, our organizations and our individuals have those that are part and parcel of what we're trying to achieve that give. And I think we all could do a much better job of recognizing that and acknowledging it uh, and making them feel that you're grateful for it. And I think if organizations can say, how do we show better gratitude for our members? How do we show better gratitude for our staff? How do we show better gratitude for our leaders? If in our own lives, we think about that which we take, 
could like who's in our lives every day that we just sort of take advantage of that like we just don't even realize that like they're doing things for us where's their opportunity for gratitude you know I, I i resonate very strongly with the empathy that was said earlier and i think part of that empathy comes from a place also of gratitude and of honoring and cherishing that which we have uh, and i like that as a closing note because this has been such a experience of gratitude to each of you for participating and to this community for coming together. I do need to pause for a second. Amy, can you actually come on video for a second? Do you have the capacity to do so? Uh, and so every single one of these, Amy Hayden yeah. is there communicating with you. Uh, she's the one organizing all of this. Uh, Amy is amazing. Uh, I say it's not possible without her. If you aren't connected with her, you should. She, she runs amazing interviews. If you're on her LinkedIn page, you should see the interview she's doing. And so thank you, Amy, for everything you do to help build this community. Uh, thank you to all our rock stars this entire year. Uh, you know, this is the whole point of doing this has been to just elevate the profiles of those that are leading our industry that hopefully will inspire others to be better leaders as well. Each of you do that uh, and each of you contribute in ways that inspire us. And if you're watching, please send us in those that you think should be on in 2021. Uh, and we hope to be able to continue to build you know, these leadership profiles that will let the association industry advance the missions of our organizations, making industries, society, the world a better place. Thank you to all of you. Have a safe and healthy end to 2020 and uh, even healthier, happy, and perhaps even together moments in 2021 to come. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.